Good morning. My name is Sheila McKinnon. I'm the minister here, and I welcome you to the third Sunday in the season of Lent. It is our, our pleasure this morning to have with us the very Reverend Dr. Lois Wilson, our friend. And a, There are more titles there, and I just, I'll just let them go for now. We gather at this corner, as this church has been here for a hundred years, on land that is the territory and the historic land of the people who spoke the Lekwungen Nation languages, the Songhees, the, Sang, the, Song the Saanich, and the Esquimalt Nations. When we say that, we recognize that this is their land from time immemorial and that more than that, we pray and work for a day of right relationship. I have a few announcements I want to make. Next Sunday after the worship service is a congregational meeting on the budget. There are pre-reads on the far tables and there's also a copy of our annual report. The annual report is available electronically if you care not to use the trees, but if you don't have access to that online, please take one with you. On Monday afternoon, the Women's Spirituality Group is meeting in the Doreen McLeod Room, and on Wednesday afternoon, a conversation about the Celtic Saints will be happening up in the social suite. These and other announcements are included in your service leaflet. We continue to hold open our book of condolences for the victims of the shooting of the mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand, and they will be available for you to sign during the coffee hour. I don't know if anyone else has other announcements to make at this time. Good morning. I just wanted to thank everyone who came and supported the Sprague High School Choir concert yesterday afternoon. As, as you well know, if you heard, were there, it was quite an amazing choral experience, really incredibly moving singing by 50 fresh young voices. Really, really lovely. And we managed to raise nearly $1,400 for our music bursary fund, so thank you so very much. I'm sorry, somebody's holding something up. That Irish Saints has been mentioned. Okay. This is about the meeting that's kind of a follow-up to the Bill Blakey presentation last Sunday, a meeting between civic leaders and cooperatives on Saturday. I have the information. Saturday the... Next Saturday, 30th. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Vanessa.
you'll see that the call to worship is for us all to say as we invite each other to join in this exercise of praise. Would you pray with our call to worship with me? O God, who gives us the morning sun and the evening star, we have gathered to thank you in this community. O God, in whom we live and breathe and have our being, we have gathered to worship you. Our gathering prayer is up on the slide. Let us pray. Blessed are you, God of planting and harvest, birthing and growth. Through the gifts of creation, you care for all. Bless us and all families, O God, as this new season of seeding and growth begins. Increase in us an awareness of our interdependence with all creation. May we hear your word to us, challenging and inspiring us. May ours be the faith that issues in action. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. My name is Melanie Emels. I am the Children and Youth Minister here at First Met. And I welcome all of our children and youth to come forward. You may notice our children are carrying eggs with them today. I'll get you one. And one is already broken. We are doing gentleness today as part of our fruits of the spirit. And so they're practicing gentleness by taking care of eggs this morning. Does everyone know what gentleness means? It means being gentle, yes. Yeah, but I didn't really be gentle. But it was an accident. I put it on the chair. She put it on the chair. But but it fell. So there's an example of sometimes how gentleness doesn't always work. I was still touching it. You were still touching it. So gentleness. Even God. Even God, yes. Gentleness is deliberate kindness. It's a strong hand with a soft touch. It's a tender, compassionate approach towards others' weaknesses. A gentle person still speaks truth, sometimes even when it's painful, being considerate to others, putting away our pride, serving others. All of these things are being gentle. 
But those are a lot of words, aren't they? Can I show you what being gentle means? Yeah, I'm not doing that. That's true. Take a look at this. This is a silk scarf. My grandfather told me in World War I, so his father, so that would be my great-grandfather, he was a fighter pilot. And they figured out that if they took silk, so this is silk, so you hold it over there, you hold it over here, pull on it. Pull really tight. Wow. Silk is really soft. And it's very, everyone else just touch it. It's very gentle. It's very soft. It's very comfortable to sleep in. Some of us even have silk sheets. Well, my grandfather told me that what they figured out was that silk, if you wrapped it really tightly, and then you... It would be good for a bandage. Yep, that's true too. But if they wrapped it really tightly and they put it around their heads, it would stop slow-moving bullets. Silk would stop slow-moving bullets. Isn't that amazing? This is such a gentle, soft fabric, yet it is so strong that in certain conditions, it will stop bullets. That is what gentleness is like. Gentleness is really, really, really kind and compassionate, but it's also very powerful and very strong, just like silk. There's someone else that we've been talking about who's also very gentle. His name was Jesus, and he was really gentle too. But yet he was so strong because he could heal people and he could teach people and he could make friends with people. I know. You didn't know that? Huh? Well, we learn something new every day. Every single day we learn something. So gentleness is something that we learn about with Jesus and we learn about every day and we can practice everything that we've learned. So let's pray. Can we pray? Yes, pray. But how do we... We'll talk about that. Dear God, thank you for the gift of gentleness. Help us each practice this fruit of the Spirit as we reach out to each other with radical love and radical gentleness. We love you, God. Amen. Please join us in sitting or standing as we sing the song for this month. Amen. This morning's scripture reading is from Isaiah, chapter 55. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? 
and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run, on, shall run to you, because the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord that he may have mercy on them and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it shall be to the Lord for a memorial, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. This is part of our story.
I greet you in the name of Jesus Christ, whose body we are, and bring the greetings from other members of the body with whom I've been in worship. We think today of the Coptic Orthodox Christians in Egypt who are under persecution, of the Roman Catholic Christians in Sudan who carry on in the midst of an intractable civil war, and we think of the Presbyterian Church in the Republic of Korea, one of the long hundred-year partnerships of the United Church of Canada, who presented me with this stole several years ago, and it's the only stole I own, so it's a stole for all seasons. So I wear it all the time. So we bear up those congregations and people in our prayers as we expect them to pray for us and to know of our work here. I was elected moderator of the United Church of Canada in 1980. And when I was elected, my husband came to join me at the podium and he told a story. He said, you know, we knew it was going to happen because we went out for Chinese dinner last night and we cracked open a fortune cookie and her fortune cookie said, tomorrow you will be head of the organization. (laughs) Well, so um, can we be so sure of the future now, though? Is it so positive? There was recently an article uh, by CBC that said, In the next decade, one-third of Christian churches across the country will be closed. And we experience the absence of large numbers of children. Grandchildren are largely absent. People do not come so often for baptisms or for marriages or out in the field or out in the wherever. And funerals are on the golf course and wherever. So that... The situation is so changed. We're in a deep cultural shift in Canada. And it's hard because for so long our culture supported our churches and it no longer does so. And so we're kind of at sea wondering what is the future and what it holds for us. We're not alone. This has happened. We were preceded by Germany where it used to be if you paid your taxes that helped. If you were baptized you had to pay taxes to the church. So a lot of people started renouncing their baptism. (laughs) And in England, of course, the Church of England has largely collapsed, except for a a remnant. So we should not be surprised, in the Western world at least, the Christian cause seems to be diminishing, certainly among the mainline churches anyway. What do we do then? How do we face the future? Is there a word of hope for the future? Is there anything ahead? Some people, of course, just give up in in despair, and some um, are lamenting. Some are very hopeful. So we struggle about about the fact that our community has been displaced in the country. Recently, I I, I was talking to a student at Emmanuel College who said, you know, I was reading some of your books, and when you were in in active ministry, the church actually engaged the nation on matters of national importance. We don't do that anymore. She was very surprised to read about our history. So there's a sense in which we are, as Isaiah wrote, we are people in the wilderness, the wilderness being a metaphor for the absence of absence of God, the absence of a healing community. And it's incumbent on us to think about the shape of the future. Psalm 78 puts it very well. Is God able to spread a table in the wilderness? Is God still able to spread a table in the wilderness that will nourish us? And I've used the metaphor of a wilderness or empire, whatever you want to say, a society with which we are in some conflict in terms of our values, because we live in a society which is where the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. Um, three governments at least are in utter chaos, Canada and the UK and the US, and things are not as they should be. Is there a word here? Is there a word from Isaiah that addresses this? 
Well, in Isaiah 55, a wonderful passage, I got onto it because some of you are old enough to remember that old movie, uh, How Green Was My Valley. And when the four sons of the miner had to leave Wales because the, the coal mines had dried up, the father says, oh, that calls for Isaiah 55. We're going to have to read that. So it's a, it's, a, it's a poem, really, about the future. And Isaiah was a visionary. Uh, he was a poet. So don't read this literally. Please don't read it literally. Read it as an invitation to let your imagination flow and be informed by the poetry of it, because it is a vision of the future. There's a contemporary theologian, Walter Brueggemann, who speaks of us living in two worlds simultaneously. The perceived world, which is the world we're in this morning. We had our breakfast, we came, and here we are. And the proposed world, and the proposed world is the world of the gospel of Jesus, which speaks of love and mercy and compassion and forgiveness and all those things which barely exist in the perceived world. But our calling as Christians is to so live by those values of the proposed world that they become a reality. Or another way of putting it in the Gospels is we pray, Thy king, your kingdom come. In other words, we want that proposed world and is the perceived world uh, is, is what we live in. And that's also in the Gospels, but the kingdom is also here among you. So it's a paradox. It's a paradox. The proposed world, the values that are not yet visible here, and yet they are sometimes. Well, Israel was a minority, as we are, and they were in the wilderness. They just come through. Part of this is based on history, and I've got to give you a short history lesson so you'll understand it. Uh, Israel had been in captivity in Babylon, and they were just returning, but they knew Persia was coming, so it was not a good time. They were, and they didn't think they'd ever see Jerusalem, which was the center of their community, ever again. So they had been displaced, as we are displaced. And yet out of that came this vision of, of uh, Isaiah's. How, what was it? Well, it's a, it's a poet. It's a poet, poem of religious imagination. And it's a wonderful poem. It starts with a public invitation. Ho ye that hunger, come, all you that hunger, come eat, come buy, come buy from the street vendors. It's going to be like a circus. It's going to be fun. I mean, it's open to everybody. Why spend your money for, the, for junk food when you can have really good bread, really good food from what's offered to you? He uses the analogy of food here as uh, our consumer society, which offers all sorts of false values with which we disagree, uh, and saying, but God offers something which will satisfy and you'll not be hungry. So why buy into the consumer society? Why don't you take on your true identity as a, as a son or daughter of God and live as though the presumed world or the proposed world's values are here and take on your own identity. Because after all, there is a creation to manage. There's lots of things to be done out there and we need your help. And you too can be like Martin Luther King, free at last, free at last, because you've made the decision. The text, ref the text refers to the, then to the historic covenants of God uh, with starting with Abraham and Moses and David and the whole rest of them. And any well-informed person who knows the history of our community will have some confidence in those covenants, that our history has said that God is reliable, that he's not just going to jettison us and leave us on our own. And there's a source of hope there. It's a long, long covenant. However, sometimes the vision, the vision that is held up to us of a better world, fails. There's the apocryphal story of a Jewish rabbi who uh, rented a storefront uh, during Lent, and in it he put a lion and a lamb, and everybody was just astonished that the lion and the lamb lived together in this storefront for the whole of Lent. And they asked him, what, what was your secret? Oh, he says, we have a large supply of lambs. 
So sometimes the vision does fail, but it's there. Well, then Isaiah goes on to talk about repentance. That's our side of the covenant. God will provide all this free meal in a circus on the street with vendors and so on with really good food, but we have to repent. Now, repent does not mean feeling sorry, and for United Church people, it's not a very popular thing. Repent really means take a new direction, and that means new choices in economically, politically. I think you heard from Bill Blakey last week, and he, I'm sure, laid this out. So it's not just an airy fairy, I feel sorry, but it means a definite change in direction and particular choices that you make. Uh, it's not just a change of heart. Some time ago, some, some um, theologians from Latin America came to Canada as our guests, and afterwards they were asked, what did you make of the Canadian churches? They said, well, it's fine, except all their church people seem to think that repentance is feeling sorry, and that's not it at all. So it's much more than that. Um, and I wonder why in so many United Churches across the country there is no prayer of confession. Is it because we think we've arrived? I don't know. But we need to reclaim that part of our story because we're not perfect. So we are in Lent, a season of lament, absorbing the anguish of the rest of the world. And it's an absolute prerequisite for the rest of the story. Isaiah then turns to the mystery of God's uh, meaning, it, uh, and its reliability, and says, you know, God's care for us and the offering of free food and in a, in a place of famine in the wilderness is as sure as when you plant seeds and they come up and they sprout. So it will happen, and not immediately. And then they're offered symbols of hope, symbols of Sarah having a child when she was way beyond child time. Uh, I recently met a young man who said to me, well, you know, I'm going to get married soon, but we're not going to have children because I can't bear to bring a child into this world. We've only got 12 years before climate change is irreversible, and I just cannot, cannot conceive of that. So a child is a sign of hope and it is a sign of faith in the future, which some don't embrace. So there are symbols out there. Well, the rest of the, of the passage of Isaiah is uh, assuming that we have taken a different direction, that we have made these hard choices, that in fact we are doing our part in the covenant and in bringing the presumed, presumed proposed world to the perceived world, then in fact, uh, there will be hope. And um, he, he talks about it very openly and answers the question, can God set a table in the wilderness affirmatively? Yes, it can happen. And the whole of Isaiah at the end burst into doxologies of praise. I mean, it's a wonderful passage when he talks about the, all of nature, the trees clapping their hands, and all of nature joining in. So hope is found in the wilderness. Now, what's hope? Oh, when, hope isn't hope if you can see it. I once took a group of students to Argentina to visit the base communities there. The base communities were started by the Catholic Church, and they, got, they were consisting of slum dwellers that a priest gathered together, and the slum dwellers had been evicted from their homes because a big modern highway had put in to bring the tourists from the airport to this posh hotels. And here were these poor people in the slum, utterly discarded and seemingly without hope. But the Catholic Church brought together a priest who would, who would nurture these small communities. So we went to visit, they called them base communities, we went to visit them one day, and they were all over there and we were all over here, and the students all had their cameras out clicking, you know, and finally, one of the people in the base community said, would you please put your camera away and would you come and join us? And they talked about hope because they lived in what looked like a hopeless situation. And my experience is that people who have so much hope always come out of a hopeless situation. 
I spent some of my time on your behalf in South Korea when a whole generation of students was slaughtered because of their struggle for democracy and human rights. And meeting with some of the professors who had lost their jobs and been imprisoned because of their struggle for democracy uh, was very enlightening. They would tell jokes about each other. Oh, 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 you betrayed me. And then they'd laugh uproariously. And I couldn't believe it that people who had suffered the most indignities were the most hopeful. So hope, it seems to me, comes out of hopeless situations. And in the Book of Romans we read, now hope that is seen is not hope. Well, Isaiah speaks of hope not only of ourselves, but of the all of creation. So here is a word, I think, for us in Lent from Isaiah 55, a word that says there are many people in history who are well known to God and many who are not well known. And we look to the day when they will all gather together, when Desmond Tutu and John Vanier and Sheila McKinnon and you and me and the people in jail and the prisoners and the people living under the bridge and the people who have nothing to eat and the people without hope will come together and will laugh and dance and sing. Wait for it. Watch for it. For the kingdom will come. Amen. Join me, please, in the prayer of dedication. O God, who brings us out of darkness into light, out of winter into springtime, and out of death into life, bless us, we pray, as we seek to respond to all your gifts to us. Amen. The lighting and the extinguishing of these candles symbolizes the light of Jesus slowly but surely fighting to overcome the darkness. The closer we get to Good Friday, the less light there is. On Good Friday itself, even the center candle is extinguished in addition to all of the exterior candles. The central candle, also known as the Christ candle, represents Jesus who we as Christians believe our Savior, the pure light. Each of the outer candles has a lament attached to it. The first lament was for homelessness. The second was for the salmon and the, orca, the, salmon and the oceans. Today, Shirley Chatfield is our Tenebrae speaker.
Today, our lament concerns a rather common condition, that of dementia, one form of which is Alzheimer's disease. I preface my remarks by saying I do not have a medical background, nor have I ever had the unfortunate situation of having a close family member who was afflicted. My interest comes from a lifetime interest in pastoral care. It is concerning and even frightening how many times we hear of personalities who have received the diagnosis of dementia. I am sure most of us have friends or a family member who are dealing with its progression. I am going to share several experiences I have had over the past 40 plus years. The first was a very dear lady who I visited under the Visiting Eldership Program and we had become good friends. It became apparent there was something wrong when she began to forget I was going to make my regular call as arranged by telephone in my lunch hour. This was for a visit in the early evening the same day. Fortunately, her daughter came to Victoria and realized her mother was no longer able to care for herself. About six months later, my mother and I visited her in a very nice complex care facility in Calgary. The change in her was very pronounced. She was extremely frustrated at being unable to express her ideas in a full sentence. Some years later, mother and I visited some of her cousins in Iowa, amongst whom were Aggie and Bob. Bob was a veteran of the Korean War who was, had returned home to become a highway patrolman. He was definitely not your TV example of a highway patrolman. No Eric Estrada there. Or for the people that we see in the news broadcasts picking people up for wrongdoing. He was about my height and of slight build. However, he had several commendations for his work. One of his hobbies was working with wood. He made the most glorious grandfather clocks from scratch. In one of her Christmas letters, Aggie told us Bob had been diagnosed with dementia. He was at the stage of sleeping most of the day. And often in the evening and during the night, he was up trying to go to the basement they no longer had. Eventually, Abby, Aggie's doctor told her she must place Bob in care unless she wanted to wind up in the hospital herself. Reluctantly, she agreed, but visited him every day until he died some years later. I will never forget her response to my expression of sadness at their situation. Surely, she said, when we married, we made a number of vows. One of them was for better or for worse. This is part of the for worse. Sadly, on my last visit to Iowa a few years ago, Aggie herself was in care with dementia. One of my former employers had a similar situation to Aggie and Bob. Even having made a promise to herself and her husband, eventually his wife had to agree to a care facility for him. When I visited him in the facility, he, like my first friend, was very frustrated in his inability to express himself. Sadly, while caring for her husband, his wife had ignored a sore on her leg. By the time he had died and she sought treatment, the diagnosis was metastasized cancer. Unfortunately, about eight months after his death, we met to celebrate her life. Not long ago, I was stopped by one of my neighbors in the hall of my apartment building. I had suspected something was not quite right with her husband, as for some time he had not been driving. She told me he had been diagnosed with dementia two years before. In case we ran into each other in the hall, taking out the 
recycle, or for whatever reason, she wanted me to know about a change in his personality. She said he had never sworn in all the years she had known him. At that point, they had been married for over 50 years. But now he had, as she put it, begun to use some pretty fancy terms of phrase. She she had wanted me to understand what was happening to him and not to be surprised if something like this happened. This is another side of dementia. The final story is the mother of a friend of mine who died lately at 99 and a half. She had lost her husband to the complications of Alzheimer's many years ago. Now three of her four quote-unquote children are in varying stages of dementia, including my friend. Can you imagine what a sense of loss this wife and mother must have carried in her heart? As well as remembering and trying to support those suffering with the condition, we must support the partners and families. I am so glad we have the caregiver support group here in the church. There is an inevitability on all the, in all these examples. They end in a sense of sorrow. In some way, this is rather like the sense of sorrow of the, and the sense of the inevitable in the events leading up to Good Friday. I sometimes get asked how to talk to people with dementia. I really don't have an answer to that question, except to say, be as natural as you can and follow their lead. Some people are fine with you trying to help them complete ideas when you are sure what they are attempting to say. They will usually let you know if they do not want that help. Sometimes we just need to listen and to be present. We just need to be. May it be so. On your behalf, I wanted to say a couple of thank yous. Reverend, doctor, etc., Lois, thank you so much for being a friend to this congregation over many years and for coming back and um, gracing us, instructing us, and encouraging us this morning. Lois reminded us of our deep connection with churches far from here and people that we ourselves may never visit, who both rely on us and inspire us 
those web, that web of relationship is very important as we continue to seek to hear the voice in the wilderness and even sometimes to be the voice in the wilderness. And that at a very different end, surely you reminded us of the close relationships in this congregation and how in our relationships we have opportunities for lament and then also opportunities to be a resource and a support. I would share with you that Barbara Langdon lost her sister on Thursday and is in Kamloops with her and ask and commend her to your prayers. There are people we pray for each week in this congregation. The prayer team here works constantly connecting, remembering, sharing, and lifting up those who mourn, those who are in hospital, those who are experiencing the effects of all the many dislocations in life. Louise, Dennis, Anne, and Helen are in hospital. We remember them. But also, we remember all those who grieve, like Barb, like the friends of Jamie Shaw back home on Bowen. And we also celebrate, I see in the bulletin that somebody is turning 100 this coming weekend. So for those of you going to that party, I think you should start blowing up the balloons probably tonight. And um, by next Saturday, you'll be all done the 100 you need. But what a wonderful opportunity that is to celebrate the good times. And so we go. We go from here, one part of a vast web located in history, in geography, and in the blessed imagination of the sacred spirit. We are resourced. We are encouraged. We are perplexed. We can be bewildered. We are never alone. In life, in death, and life beyond death, God is with us. Thanks be to God. Amen.